Hello, and welcome to our podcast on what we are calling anchoring in academic writing. Now, I'm pretty sure that this is just a term that I have made up over the years in my effort to try and help students organize their writing better. I'm sure it's called other things in other contexts, and other teachers have other names for this skill of organization, but the one that I'll be going with is the idea of anchoring. So let's go back to our general paragraph structure. So you can see here we start off a paragraph with the idea of a claim, and then we speak in chunks of three using the point, evidence, and analysis structure. And then we're going to go ahead and end a paragraph with the idea of a conclusion. Now think about this. You can take that general structure and stretch it out, and you have yourself an essay. So in an essay, each PEA, or point evidence analysis chunk, becomes perhaps a body paragraph. If you take that and you stretch it out even more because you have so much to talk about, you might have yourself an extended essay. And so you're not necessarily writing three body paragraphs, you're writing three body chunks when some of the questions that you are asked are so in-depth that you need a couple paragraphs in each third of it to fully explain yourself. But this idea of making a point and then providing evidence and then analyzing why you think that quote explains what you think it explains, that is the basic structure of academic writing. And that's kind of what we're talking about today in an idea to help you guys organize your papers better. So how does this relate to anchoring? Our analysis of a text must be anchored to the text or to a definition if we have been asked a question or given a prompt that has a piece of definition or a piece of jargon in it. If we've been given a prompt where we are maybe comparing two different texts, we have to figure out which one of these texts is the most grounded, which one is the most central. That's where we're going to establish how we connect back and forth between multiple texts. Additionally, when we are writing academically, we must prove that we fully understand all elements of the texts that we have at our disposal. So if we are asked a prompt that has a term or some jargon in it, and then we're asked to explain how a text relates to that, we must fully and completely define the term, show our understanding of it, then go to the text that we're asked to compare and show how that compares to that definition that we have explained. If we don't fully understand both sets of the question and text setup, then we're setting ourselves up for a pretty poorly written paper. And as we go through, we'll show you some more specific examples of these throughout. So here are some steps that will help you think about how to anchor your responses better. First step, we need to decipher the prompt. What exactly are we being asked to do? Are there any terms or jargon or words that we need to define? And if so, we need to define those pretty quickly. What exactly is the prompt asking us to do? Is it asking us to compare, which means show how things are just similar? Or is it asking us to contrast, show how things are just different? Is it asking us to just discuss, where we kind of have a little bit more free range about what we want to say and how we want to say it? We have to figure out exactly what the prompt is asking us. Then we can start to move forward. Step two is going to be to decide what is the anchor in our response. And oftentimes, in the type of prompts that high schoolers get, the anchor is often a term or a piece of vocabulary that the prompt is asking us to define in another text. And again, we'll show you some examples of that. It could also be the main text that we are reading the one that we spent more time on, the one that has more points of integration, or the central text. But in our organization of our writing, where we're showing our thinking, we must think about which of these texts are we going to anchor to. That needs to happen first, because that will help set up our organization a little bit better. And so if we go back to that academic structure, the point of anchoring our writing is that the writing must continually go back to our anchor. We must continually remind our reader how this new text relates to the anchor text. The stuff that we're talking about in this new text must relate. It can't just be on its own. It can't just be an unfounded opinion. It can't just be some random fact. Anything we share about this new text that we may be analyzing must be grounded in the idea of the anchor. 
And that could be a definition, that could be a more central text. And again, we'll show you some examples in a minute. Step number four is the idea of the use of transitions and of showing while we're writing. These transitions and the use of them allows the reader to follow our thinking. If we're going to show that the new text is similar to our anchor definition, then we need to use transitions that continually show similarity, such as similarly or along the same lines. We need to continually show through our transition usage the relationship we're trying to prove. Additionally, we need to work to show our thinking, not just tell it. We cannot assume that the reader is in our heads. We must be very explicit in our academic writing. If you want to say that the new text is different from the anchor, then you need to use those transitions that continually set up how they are different. But we also need to remind the reader over and over again how they are different. And we need to continually say they are different, they are unlike each other, they are disparate. So that helps with not only the transitions, but also with the examples we use. So let's go ahead and talk through a couple examples of typical prompts that a high school student may get and talk about them in terms of the anchoring that we've just mentioned. Here's an example with a jargon definition. Explain how Jack London uses foreshadowing in To Build a Fire. We have a word, foreshadowing, which is a very English jargon thing, and we have the new text, the short story, To Build a Fire. So if we go through our steps, we have to figure out what's going to be the anchor here. And in this case, the best choice of an anchor is the term of foreshadowing. So our second step is we have to make sure that we are clear about what foreshadowing is. Then once we've done that, we have to give an example of a type of foreshadowing just in general, and then compare to the new text. How is it used in To Build a Fire? Then we go back to our anchor. Here's another style of foreshadowing he uses, because that's our anchor definition. And then we go to the new text again. Here's how this one is used in To Build a Fire. And we repeat that at least three times. The anchoring philosophy in this case is that we are always going back to the definition of foreshadowing. Then we introduce something from the short story. Back to the definition, back to the short story. We're always going back to that definition in this case. Here's another example of anchoring that may come in some sort of other academic class. Explain how the checks and balances system worked in the Watergate scandal in the 1970s. Again, we have a piece of jargon. We have some terminology from a content class. So our paper must begin with what in the world checks and balances is. Maybe explain it a little bit. Just generally how the legislative branch checks judicial, etc., etc. Then we're going to take one piece of that checks and balance system and talk about one piece of Watergate and explain how they connect. Then we're going to go back to checks and balance and mention another piece. And then we mention a similar piece in Watergate. Go back to checks and balances, explain one more piece of that, and then show how that happened in Watergate. And the point is we're always going back to the anchor as opposed to what often happens with students and their writing where they say, here's what checks and balances is. They write a huge long paragraph about what it is. And then they just go, in Watergate, here's what happened. A, B, and C, we're done. They are expecting the reader in that case to make the connections on their own. They're expecting the reader to say, oh, here's A from Watergate. Clearly that fits in the checks and balances this way. And then here's B. Oh, clearly that fits in the checks and balances this way. No, 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 we don't want our reader to have to work. We as writer need to set up the pattern. So it goes checks and balances, element A of Watergate. Another part of checks and balances, element B of Watergate. And then repeat, we're always going back to that anchoring idea. Let's go ahead and look at another example of anchoring, this time with a multitude of texts. And so in this case, there is a very clear anchor text that all other text must be referred back to. So if we have a prompt that says, discuss which songs or artists Betty Friedan would agree with or support, given your reading of the feminine mystique. Okay, well, in order for us to even say that Betty Friedan might support the words of Beyonce and she might not support the words of Katy Perry, what do we have to establish? We clearly have to establish what did Betty Friedan say? What did she think? 
when she was writing these words. Then we have an anchor that we can take the comparison texts to. If Betty Friedan would believe A, we can then compare it to other songs by Beyonce or Pink that would agree with A. But then we have to go back to Friedan. What else would she agree with? S establish that through some quotes and explanation, then go to songs that she would agree with. Then go back to Friedan and say, here's what she also said. And then at this point, we would maybe talk about what songs Friedan would not agree with. But we can't just say in one paragraph, here's everything that Betty Friedan thinks, feels, and believes. One other paragraph say, and here's what she would like and not like, and yes, and no, and yes, you know. That's not well organized. It's also not very convincing because the readers like hit over the head with this long barrage of just stuff. As writers, we must slow the pace, give something from the anchor, give something from the comparison. Go back to the anchor, go to the comparison continually go back and forth. But in this case, we're always going back to the anchor, which in this case would be the feminine mystique. Now, sometimes you're going to get prompts that have the potential for a variable anchor, meaning that the prompt doesn't clearly set up any one text as your anchor. And so your job as reader slash writer is to figure out, based on the prompt, which would be the best to anchor my thoughts to. Oftentimes, it's a good idea to use the longer text as your anchor. Other times, you might want to pick the one that is more quote-unquote legitimate. And in my mind, that means, you know, pick the one that your class spent more time on, the one that you read together, the one that is kind of in the canon of literature. Use that as the one you always come back to. And then use the song or the film clip to be the new text and respond back to the other one as your anchor. Other times, there's no real setup, and they're both equally long and dense and on their own. So then you as writer, when you start writing, whichever text you start writing about first, then that's going to be your anchor. You're going to talk about text A, then text B, and then the next paragraph, text A, and then text B. You don't want to vary that pattern once you've set it up. So here's an example. Discuss the siblings' relationships with each other as revealed by their experiences with snow, using a short chapter from To Kill a Mockingbird and a poem called Snow. In that case, I'd probably go with Mockingbird as my anchor text. That selection was a little bit longer, comes from a little bit more well-known text, there's more points of connection, and then use the short poem of Snow as the one I'm going to compare back to To Kill a Mockingbird. Another one, contrast the author's comments about effort using the song Try by Pink and Please, Please, Please by The Smiths. Since we have two songs that are about the same length, about the same topic, and we're just going to contrast that, we can choose either one as our anchor. So whichever one we talk about first, that's the one that always gets talked about first. If you want to do pink, then The Smiths, that's totally fine, but maintain that pattern throughout your paper. One more example here. How about the prompt, why are relationships between fathers and sons so important? Using a song from the musical Kinky Boots, a song from the musical Catch Me If You Can, a selection from the piece Death of a Salesman, and maybe a film clip from the movie Kronk's New Groove that all deal with fathers and sons. At this point, maybe you choose Death of a Salesman based on our last criteria. It's probably the longest, it's the most quote-unquote legitimate, and it gives you a lot of integration points. If for some reason you're not feeling that, fine, pick something else as your anchor text, but always go back to that same anchor every time you compare something new to it. That's going to help with organization, and organization is going to help your reader understand your message. And again, the point is, you don't just list everything from kinky boots and move on, and then a paragraph on catch me if you can, and then a paragraph on death of a salesman. No, you have to alternate. Put things that are together or similar together in your paper. Mention the anchor, mention the new. Anchor, new, repeat until done. So that's what we have in terms of anchoring in academic writing. Again, kind of a homegrown term that we've come to use in our class to set up the organization of pieces. As always, if there are things that are unclear, please bring those into class so we can make them more clear and help you improve upon your organization and your clarity in writing. So thanks for listening. If you have any questions, bring those in, and we will see you soon. Thanks a lot.